always an unexpected adventure out there on the mountain bike. So welcome to the GP Llama YouTube channel and to a power meter review that I've been looking forward to sharing for a very long time. So today Favero have launched their next generation power meter product and that is the Asioma Pro MX. What's new? Let's get straight into details right away. This pedal based power meter is an all new design from Favero. The Pro MX is an SPD pedal body with all the electronics packed into and protected within the spindle. They claim at least 60 hours battery life between charges and the Pro MX now offers the full suite of cycling dynamics metrics including PCO, platform center offset. So I have been riding these pedals now for around a year and I have over 5,000 kilometers already clocked up on them on both the gravel bike and the mountain bike on all terrain and in all conditions. And I can confirm they are good, very, very good. Now this video did end up being quite lengthy, so I have put chapters in the video description so you can jump ahead to the sections that you want to know about. But if you are clicking ahead or clicking anywhere, be sure to also click that subscribe button. It really helps out and helps me continue making content like this. Diving deeper into the technical specifications of these products, and I say products because there are three offerings announced today. Those being the MX2, the dual-sided power meter pedal, the MX1, single-sided, and the MX Up, which is the upgrade kit for the MX1, bringing it up to the MX2 dual-sided. The pedal type is an SPD, so suitable for mountain bike, cross-country, gravel, and cyclocross. This is Fevero's own pedal body too, designed and manufactured in Italy, not a third-party pedal body. The bearings, each side has two by needle roller bearings, the stack height of the pedal, 11.2 millimeters. The pedal Q factor isn't an official spec in the tech sheets, but I have measured it out to be around 53.2 millimeters, so no compromise there on pedal Q factor. The weight claimed each side, 191.4 grams. So the dual sided MX2 coming in at just under 383 grams for the pair. I will be putting these on the scales in just a moment. Should they ever be needed, pedal body replacements are quite cost effective coming in at 49 euros plus VAT because there is no electronics in the pedal body at all. And speaking of those electronics, jumping down to the stats on those, power measurement is between 0 and 3000 watts. Power accuracy margin of error, plus or minus 1%. Cadence measurement, no magnets required. It's all accelerometer based between 10 and 250 RPM. The battery is internal and rechargeable. Favero claim at least 60 hours of operation between charges. These pedals support Ant Plus and Bluetooth connections, up to three of those. The data you'll get over those, power, cadence, left-right balance on the MX2. And there is additional data with IAV Cycling Dynamics, where you can get power phase, platform center offset, torque efficiency, pedal smoothness, and rider position. I'll show all of those in action shortly. There's active temperature compensation. Auto calibration is supported. However, you will need to do a manual calibration on first install or swapping these between bikes. The MX Pro does support non-round chain rings, so oval or Q rings. The ingress protection is IP67, six being dust tight, seven being rated for one meter water immersion for up to 30 minutes. Device management for configuration, firmware, remote diagnostics is all done via the Fevero Asioma mobile app on iOS and Android. Max user weight of 120 kilos and a warranty of two years. When it comes to pricing, it's always best to check directly on the Fevero website. They have sent over some initial pricing here of 614 euros plus VAT directly from Fevero. And they've also given an indication in Aussie dollars, they'll be around 12.99 here in Australia. For the MX1 and MX Up, definitely check on the Favero website for the latest pricing. As always, Favero have a very nice looking box. All your pedal details there on the back. And then as we slide this out, comes in a very neat looking package. Manual. I believe they're re-greasing tools, cleat kit and the pedals themselves, Oops. charge pod, charge pod, charge cable information, put all that aside, cleats and mounting hardware and pedal washers if required, but here we are, this is what it's all about, the long-awaited Asioma Pro MX. With the words Asioma Pro MX written on both sides on the pedal platform, that's one reference to know which side these go on, so right, left, but there's also a small notch in the left hand side on the spindle, indicating that that's the left hand side. Now the first thing of note is these are quite light, and 
the stack height does actually stack up too. Not looking too big there at all. All right, most important. Let's put these for the weight test. Claimed weight of 191.4 each. Oh, it doesn't get any closer than that. Three eighty four. As reference, Garmin Rally claimed weight of two twenty two grams each. Okay, it's coming in under spec, but is well, you can actually feel it in the hand. That is only a few grams, but coming in at four. That'll do, 441 grams. And as a quick reference, these have a stack height of 13.5 mil. So these are known as some chunky monkeys. Okay, let's have a look at the Q factor on these. Now the Q factor isn't a specification in the manual. But pulling these out to around center pedal. Q factor being the width of the pedal from the spindle interface to the crank and the center of the pedal body. And this is only a very rough measurement slash estimate. And we're looking at around, I'd be going about 53.3, 53.2 maybe, but very, very close to every other pedal that you'll have on your bike and no compromise with your, uh, your stance width or Q factor of the pedals with the Asioma Pro MX. Very, very happy to see that. And stack height, which is listed as 11.2. Let's have a quick look at that, just to verify. And I think that's pretty close as well. Excellent, that's really, really good to see. A closer look at the charger, and you do get two of these for each side. Magnetic charging, it is a proprietary charger that will just Simply clip onto the pedal. The connection inside there is still a micro USB. So the cable supplied does have a micro USB. Where are they? Right here on the end. Micro USB there. Would have been nice to see those USB-C, but maybe that's a running change they could make in the near future given it's only the chargers. The cleats that arrived in my box are genuine Shimano SM-SH51 cleats. Pretty standard mounting hardware nowadays. And Favera also supply four, four, <laughs> pedal washers. With all the technology and the battery packed into the spindle of the Asioma Pro MX, the installation process has changed. No longer using an 8mm hex wrench there, you'll need a 15mm open-ended wrench right here. Before getting these on the bike, let's get them activated by connecting them to the USB chargers, loading up the Favero app, which will take us through the wizard, which has all the information that you need to get these on the bike correctly, showing you here how to correctly install them, making sure the clearance to the chain and chain stays is at least four millimeters, some washers for that, torque specifications, how to install the cleats, pedal tension adjustment. It's got everything in this wizard that you need to know to get these on the bike. Okay, taking us through first connection and activation. Now it is super important that Favero pedals are activated because without this, they report zero watts. So you can see here, both not active. We click on activate, typing in my name, last name, email address, and agreeing to the terms and conditions, click activate. That will then register these pedals. The app will then take you through some information regarding pairing, calibration, and also some notes on first use, where the cranks will need to revolve around 10 times before the pedals wake up and start doing their thing. Right, you may have noticed just before, these pedals did need a firmware update. So I'll get that done right here. It's as simple as clicking update. I'll fast forward this part of the video. Only takes a few minutes. And once done, everything is good to go. Okay, from there, reconnecting to the pedals and everything from here looks very familiar. If you're already across Asioma Duos with a little live option down the bottom there, showing you some real time pedal information. I'll dive into this in just a few moments. In regards to configuration, crank length, manual calibration, power scaling, travel mode, automatic standby, dual to single sided, plus also the hidden menu right down there under advanced. And with a big warning, you do have the ability to do a static weight test for these pedals, should you need to do so. Something I'll dig into in another video. Following the procedure shown in the app, making sure everything is clean, single washer for these, small amount of grease, installing them by hand for a start. 
making sure nothing is cross-threaded, and then snugging them down just a little bit with a 15mm open-ended wrench, and then snugging them right down to spec. Now hold up just one minute. Why am I not using a torque wrench? Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. I've never actually used a torque wrench to install power meter pedals. So how do I know the pedals are correctly torqued to spec? Let's ask somebody who's a lot smarter than I am, ChatGPT. On screen here I have my mountain bike and my 15mm open-ended wrench, where most of the force I'm applying on the wrench during installation is around 170 millimeters from the center of the pedal spindle. So asking our friend ChatGPT, lever length of 170 millimeters, I need a torque of 40 newton meters, and what is the force in kilograms? And after a few seconds, ChatGPT will give me a lesson on exactly everything I need to know, and concludes we need around 24 kilos of downward force to generate 40 newton meters of torque using a lever arm of 170 mil. How do I know what 24 kilos is? Well, it's not light, I'll give you that. And look, if you really wanted to get tricky, grab yourself a set of analog scales and push down on the wrench until you see yourself weighing 24 kilos less, or maybe more easily, get yourself a torque wrench. I believe if a power meter is replacing a component on the bike, it has to perform as good as, if not better, than the component it has replaced. When it comes to these as pedals, they've been fine. Clipping in, clipping out, no issues. And also, I'm happy to report no squeaking either. With SPD pedals, the shoe will interface with the pedal platform, and some combinations will squeak, but after over a year of use, no squeaks whatsoever. Now, I do put this down to possibly that little bit of texturing they have there on the pedal. It's not smooth, but it's definitely not shiny and not squeaking with the mountain bike shoes that I have been using. Now, after 5,000 Ks of riding, I have a ton of footage just like this of me riding in perfect conditions with these pedals. I'm not gonna showcase all of that, so I have cherry-picked one of my worst moments on the bike while using these pedals, and that was up a 20% grade on a very muddy and rainy day. No auto pause. I did not need a reminder that I had just stopped. So after gathering my thoughts and the bike, it was up the road again in horrible conditions. However, the data from the power meter pedals was still good. So an indication that I'm not just an indoor rider. Sometimes I do go out and uh, get a little wet as well. Not by choice, mind you. Definitely not by choice. Before jumping into the deep dive analysis of the power accuracy of these pedals, just a quick overview of the IAV cycling dynamics and that live tab they now have in the Favero Asioma app. On screen here we have power instant, cadence instant, power phase, also peak power phase between those two red lines there, which is configurable. PCO, the new addition, so platform center offset, showing where I'm putting pressure on the pedal. Torque effectiveness and pedal smoothness. Now back to the peak power phase, you'll see the gradient is about to drop off here. And my peak power phase just changes a little bit as that resistance drops off. And my peak power phase just dips down towards the floor a little bit more. Now I will jump up the road a little further in a minute and show what happens when it goes uphill, but there is some interesting things that happen there on the screen. Whether this data is useful or not, I'm not quite sure yet. PCO for me is quite interesting, showing that if my cleats aren't quite set up right, or the pressure on the pedals is really far out, I might need to look into that. There are a number of configuration cogs you can see here on screen. I'll dig into all of these in another video soon. But as promised, jumping up the road to show you what happens to the peak power phase as I go uphill and the trainer pours on more resistance, that peak power phase changes position. So I'm pushing a little earlier on the pedal stroke. As I'm going uphill here, the peak power phase is pointing upwards on the simulated 3% gradient. And as I crest and start spinning a little faster, you'll see that peak power phase drop down and return to about where it was. There we go. I suspect how they calculate rider position, so seated or standing, is related to exactly where the peak power phase is. You can see here, I've just stood up on the bike, pedaling quite slowly. That peak power phase is pointing right down to the floor. I'm guessing that's where they get the calculation for out of the saddle or in the saddle for the RP value. Okay, out in the real world, how useful is this information in real time? Well, to be honest, my eyes are on the trails, not on the Cycling Dynamics page on the Edge 1040 Solar. However, the data is being recorded. You can look at it if you'd like. 
You can also look at it post-ride over at Garmin Connect or any other software that does analysis of this information. On to arguably the most important part of a power meter review, and that is a deep dive into the data coming from this power meter. Now I have 70 data sets from the last 12 months of using these pedals, and this is one of the reasons why I'm very, very happy to see them finally released, so I can start talking about them and sharing this data. Now I'm not gonna share all 70, I'll share five data sets just quickly today. Now I say just quickly because really that's all it needs. A quick brief overview because the data is good, and you will be seeing a lot more of these in upcoming videos because I can use them as a baseline to compare other power meters to. Now before I get into this data, just some background on the testing that I do here. And what you're seeing on the channel is literally the tip of the iceberg. 70 data sets, you're only seeing five case in point. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes of testing and retesting to ensure these comparative reviews are fair and repeatable. Now even after doing these tests and comparisons for years and years, there's always something new to learn. In recent times, I've been down rabbit holes, looking into the effects of different crank arms and crank types and their impact on power meter pedal readings. And more recently, I've had some interesting observations from some power meters that use CR2032 coin cell batteries that report slightly higher power with fresh batteries. As I said, something always interesting to learn and things I need to factor in when testing and retesting to present this data. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Let's look at the data and skip straight through it. Duretto XR indoor test up against the Quark Axis and the Asioma Pro MX. Tested just the other day. Overall numbers there, 183, 185, 186, all looking pretty good. Standard Llama lab test with a few new extra sections added. Steady state into the sprints, 223, 227, 226. Now this was on my gravel bike with an Eagle Axis rear derailleur, so the chain really does wrap around, so I wasn't too uh, too concerned seeing a few watts lower there on the Drito XR, possibly with those drivetrain losses. All looking fine. Into the sprints, not too far off there. The Dorito XR being a second or so later with the recording differences. And the peak powers being within about 50 watts or so. Now sprints are an interesting one. As I said, always something to learn with this data testing. Sprints are almost like fingerprints. Every one of them is different. However, let's continue on through here. I'll try and make it quick. Overs and unders into a step test, 212, 215, 215, nothing to report there, all looking good. Actually, let's go back and report something here. The Pro MXs are, I guess, a little more sensitive on the dip down and the spike up. That's pretty much all I can pull out, but overall averages look good. Some more steady states into a sprint there. Again, 190, 191, 191, nothing much to report there. Returning back to some uh, steady state stuff again to make sure nothing has uh, changed during the shakedown of that ride. 220, 220, 221. Call it a day indoors there for the Llama lab tests with all of those power meters there. Data set number two, and I'll make this super quick. Wahoo Kicker Shift, Asioma Pro MX. 206, 206, steady state, sprint, overs and unders, ramp test, all looking good. But I will pull up the sprint, diving in. <laughs> all looking good there too. Uh, peak power was within, well, within 10 watts there. Superb. Data set number three, outdoors on the mountain bike. This was a ride that I did prior to a Criterium race I was doing the next day. So a few leg openers, a bit of a warm up section, uh, steady state section through here, nice hard effort for eight minutes 33, 255.9, 256.9, with the Asiyama Pros up against the Powermax and Gcos, all looking good there. This little sprint here, Pro MX is again a little spikier at the start, and the Powermax and Gco coming along a little later, within about 20 watts there or so. Overs and unders, just riding along. Again, outdoors, very low traction with the 30 on, 30 off. Uh, 240 versus 240. This is unsmooth data, but those two are looking very, very good together. In fact, this could be a review for the Power Max and Geco mountain bike, but maybe you'll see that in another video soon. I did say we'll get through these quickly, so data set number four, gravel ride, Quark Axis, Asioma Pro MX, Cryptic Forest Loop. There is something interesting that does happen here though. Uh, let's just grab this section of data for a ride, uh, 185, 186 for 30 minutes there. Some start stops, look, that's all looking great. But further into the forest, something did happen. And I'll tell you what I did for the diagnosis of that. So just riding through here, you probably can't even see it, but there was about 10 watts difference, spot on, 10 watts difference. Yes, I've got my nose and my bike computers. So the Quark reading 253, the Asioma Pro MX is reading 243. That was uncharacteristic of both of these power meters. Jumping down for the left-right split of that section, now the quark axis will be an estimate left-right split. The Asiomas will be true left-right, given they're two independent power meters coming together as one. And there was an overall offset there, so you can see the estimated average from the quark, 127, up against the Pro MX, 120. 
and the estimated average right, 126 versus the 122. So one of them has just gone out. So I stopped and zeroed just the quark axis meter. And that does have magic zero, so it should be auto calibrating on the fly. But I was wondering, did it auto calibrate off row when I was jumping or skidding out or losing traction? I'm not quite sure, but not to my surprise. After zeroing just the quark and diving into the next 10 minutes, 241, 240, they were lining back up again. So it appears the quark had shifted a little, was brought back into line with an offset. Now maybe a back pedal, maybe my next coasting section would have fixed that with magic zero. But it was an interesting observation that two power meters disagreed a little bit. I zeroed one and it came back to this one over here. This one over here being my left hand, representing the Pro MX. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get through it. I'm having fun with this because simply it works. Um, and then my last section of the ride here, it's around Lake Wendery, dead flat, dead smooth. A good test of a power meter to see if it's swayed either way. After a hard effort, uh, three hours 15 out in the bike here, 238, 238.59. Okay, data set number five, and yesterday's race, but it wasn't a race, uh, Gravel Fondo. A lot of time spent solo yesterday. Quark Axis again, Asioma Pro MX. Now I'm using the rival alloy crank for this testing, so big heavy crank with no flex whatsoever. Jumping into, well, it's a lot of start stops here. There's a lot going on. 236, 239. Again, with those start stops, start stops, there's always going to be a bit of difference there with the recording, but that was looking good. Further into the ride, just grabbing a random section through here. 222, 221. Again, starts and stops and unsmooth data is going all over the shop. Short sprint at the end. I was solo, but I just wanted to get some sprint data. Boom, right here, what are we looking at? 21 watts difference there at 1159, 1180. Nice and smooth with the up and down. That's looking good for the sprints. And just riding home around the lake, again, dead flat, nice steady state effort, uh, 166, 166. So no phase shifting there, no offset from the sprints. Um, look, not much else to report. The Pro MX2 have been performing very, very well. So the summary of my experience with the Pro MX2 is that they're absolutely brilliant. And that's based on data from inside, outside on the gravel bike, outside on the mountain bike, and comparing them to a number of different power meters too. From here on in, I think I've got myself a new baseline power meter to use. So the data there speaking for itself, not only have Favero delivered on this new and improved Pro model power meter, they've done it with little to no compromise in an SPD pedal body. Now by little to no compromise, I mean it has a standard pedal Q factor, it has a relatively low stack height, it's the lightest SPD power meter pedal out there, and they have increased its durability by packing all the tech and the battery into the spindle itself. In my review of the Asioma Duo six years ago, I was impressed. These pedals are now one of the most loved and recommended power meter solutions on the market. And by all indications, six years from now, the Asioma Pro range should follow suit. So I am very keen to hear the experience others are having with these pedals. Maybe you're a part of the early adopter program in Italy. Maybe you've ordered these first day and you're watching this video a few weeks later and you've had a few rides. Let me know in the comments below how these pedals are going for you. All right, with that, we'll leave it there for today. Lots to take in and lots more to dig into with these pedals. And by dig into, I mean literally. These are off-road pedals. To be across those videos and more, make sure you hit subscribe here on the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.